The Agile Space. Let me try that again. The Agile Space. 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 It's not really that much of a space anymore. It's getting kind of crowded in here. Who? Put your hand up, please. Show of hands. Who's using any of the tools, frameworks, certifications, things on the on the screen right now? Put your hand up, please. I should see a lot of hands probably because there's, I know Scrum and Kanban are on there. Okay, all right, you can put your hands down now. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, is, um, is the elephant in the room. What's the elephant, you might ask? Um, well, every last one of these things up here, except for maybe the elephant, is a solution. All of these things are a solution. Do we know what the problem is? What's the problem? I'll show you a problem. Okay, for those of you who had your hands up before, for, uh, for these things, not the Beatles, um, put your hands back up. <coughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something. I wanna ask um, six questions. And they're easy, you don't panic, okay? Six yes or no questions. Um, and you know whether, whatever your role is, think about your team, or if you work with multiple teams, think about your company. Um, but answer yes or no for each one of these questions. And if you say no, just put your hand down and keep it down, okay? Hands up. First question, is the team empowered to change their process based on what they learn? Change their process, okay. Two, is there a product charter or a charter or some kind of document shared and understood? Shared jo a document that lays out the mission and strategic goals. Okay. Uh, three, do all members of the team understand those mission and goals, and are they able to see how their work contributes to both? Okay. Are teams delivering working software to at least some set of, some subset of real users every two weeks and gathering their feedback? Hands down, if it doesn't go to real users every two weeks. Is feedback is the feedback from users tur then turned into concrete work items for the team to, to work on within the uh, span of one month? And finally, six are teams are the teams empowered to change the requirements based on that feedback? All right, we have two hands up. I think that deserves a round of applause. That's awesome. Maybe you guys should be up here. Um, but congratulations, you, you guys have passed the uh, United States Department of Defense Agile Bullshit Detector. <laughs> I didn't make these questions up. Um, the Department of Defense, large government organization, you can imagine they, they deal with um, like a lot, of, uh, a lot of software companies that, and consultants that maybe you know, claim to be agile because it's some hot shit to be agile, right? You guys know. Um, and, and they came up with this as part of a larger document. There's a lot of good stuff in this document. It's free to Google, it's all, it's all out there publicly. Um, and those six questions come from that, from that uh, heuristic that, or that rubric that they use uh, to detect it. So, so if you looked around, we had so many people using those tools and only a minor fraction of, of heroes who have actually uh, made them work in the way that they were intended. They have seemingly, at least based on those six questions, solved that problem. And most of the teams, in my travels as a developer and as a coach, I, um, when a team says no to most or all of those questions, they 100% think the problem is about process. This is Eric. Um, Eric is one of those wicked smart people who says things that make you go, yeah, and you cheer, because like he says the thing that other people aren't saying, but then you realize your second thought is like, oh, I'm, wait, I'm contributing to a part of that problem, oh, and then you kind of feel bad about yourself, right? And uh, uh, this is something he said, every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket. Oh. This conference exists 
because the exchange of ideas, like I said earlier on the logo slide, is what propels us as knowledge workers. But there is a dark underbelly and plenty of questionable money to be made because we are confused about what the problem is that we're solving. And there's so much great work being done in this space and the results at the same time are not what they should be. And I think, I think it's because we're teaching the solutions first. It's why Scrum degenerates into a two-week death march with a soul-sucking daily status update attached. It's why XP and clean code and clean architecture and all that good nerd shit turns into a way for a frustrated senior developer to exert dominance and control over the code base because she doesn't have a say in a damn thing that happens outside of it. And it's why SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework, um, is simultaneously a whole career path and also every snarky Agilist's new favorite whipping boy. They say the way that you eat an elephant, yeah, I know. The way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. But in all of my metaphorical elephant eating adventures, it was never really a problem of like a, a bit limit, a bites in progress. I was never taking too many bites. It was more like, which bite do I start with? Which bite do I take first? And by teaching process, by teaching mechanics, even by teaching the, the raw stuff in the Agile Manifesto first, I think we've been taking the wrong bite first. My name is John Fazzaro, and I am I'm an Agile coach by way of being a developer. Um, I spend my days helping people and organizations understand the true nature of complex work helping them unlearn the scarcity-based destructive habits of the industrial age and adopting new generative human-centric behaviors so that they can move forward and succeed with the work that's in front of them. And here's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to talk about, first I'm gonna talk about industrialism. Um, and also a whole thing about meatloaf that Phil kind of spoiled earlier, but we'll bring it back together. Um, <laughs> uh, industrialism and the, the way it permeates and overshadows uh, everything we think about work, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to propose what I think is the actual problem, the organizing principle behind agility. And, of course, humanity and how to put that to work um, as the actual way forward. So first, let's talk about industrialism. This is Fred. Um, whether you know it or not, Fred has put a couple of notions about work into your head, and they've kind of stuck. Um, in 2001, the fellows of the Academy of Management voted the principles of scientific management, Fred's book, um, as the most influential management book of the 20th century. Anybody here know who Fred is? Fred Taylor, Frederick Taylor, right? Okay, Taylorism. Who knows what Taylorism is? Can you, can you tell us? I think it's the principle behind uh, a conveyor belt manufacturing process where you basically measure work necessary for each individual step and then optimize the work done. Yes, yeah, very good, thank you. So Taylor, Taylorism, he's the, he's the enemy of all Agilists. We hate Taylorism, right? We're always trying to undo this, this uh, turning of people into cogs on a factory line. Oh, now which one of you did that? That's not, that's not necessary. Okay, Taylor was a genius. He was a brilliant man who had a, a wonderful idea and that idea made the modern world possible. 
Work can be done more economically by a subdivision of labor, he says. Each act of each mechanic, for example, should be preceded by various preparatory acts done by other men. This core idea allowed humanity to solve the next big problem that they had a hundred or so years ago. And it was the right next thing to do. They were able to build, use this idea to bring humanity, bring, bring society out of being a distributed sort of craftsman, agrarian based thing and get everybody together into the cities and centered around factories and scale up our effort to uh, build big things and to bring people out of poverty. Um, so based on this idea, somebody like Henry Ford then could come along and hire all the Joes who had exactly the amount of skill that they needed to, to participate in the subdivision of labor, which was none. This allowed everybody to come together. We were gonna figure out how to, how to break down a job into such small pieces and give the piece out to everybody that skilled labor was not needed to scale up our efforts. And this was awesome because not only did this result in cars being built consistently at scale and affordably, but all the Joes had jobs so they could afford a car. And it was a very, it was a symbiotic system. Obviously, we know how it turned out. It's pretty great living in the modern world, honestly. But if you think about it, that's like only 100, 200 years ago tops. We started thinking like this and doing things like this. Humanity's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Why hadn't we figured this out before? Why hadn't we solved the problem at this scale with that simple idea? It turns out that humans don't naturally behave like this, and there's a trick to getting people to do this. And you have to ask them to do two things that humans do not do naturally. That's show up on time and follow instructions. And of course they don't do it naturally, so we incentivize them, right? We incentivize them with pay, uh, with a sense of job security. You belong here, you stay here, you follow instructions uh, and show up on time for 30 years and you're gonna get a gold watch and we're gonna pat you on the back and then you get to rest and then spend out your days um, you know, with a nice comfy pension. That was the deal. But that still wasn't quite enough. That was the deal on the surface, but really to get people to show up on time and follow instructions here and consistently and at scale, you had to start here. You had to teach people early on that this is what work looked like. You show up on time for that bell and you follow the instructions of the teacher. And we all sit in nice, neat little rows. You keep your eyes on your own paper. They trained <coughs> us in this, in this format. And if you look around, it's still sort of here. It's kind of baked in, right? Um, now, it's a little more subtle than that. Like my, my boss probably has, has bigger expectations of me than to just show up on time and follow instructions, right? But this, these ideas are still so cooked in there. Um, that, you know, not, like, just think about the, the, the whole last year with COVID and the, this work from home revolution. Um, and now that things are lightening up a little bit, that we've got a vaccine, that we're coming back to work, the question is, what do we do now, now that we know we don't have to come into an office? And companies are reacting very inconsistently. There's plenty of big, forward-thinking companies, Apple comes to mind the most recently, where they say, you no, know, you're all coming into the office because you're not working unless I can look out and see you typing. And it really feels like this. It really feels a lot like that to me. Um, or at least we're still not seeing past that bias that was baked in there. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe that's, Maybe that's gonna pass. Maybe we'll figure this out. 
And maybe we get this on a conscious level that our job is not to show up on time and follow instructions and just be a machine in, in cubicles now. And it's probably been a while since you were scolded for not being at your desk typing at 8 a.m. But I bet your company still has an org chart that looks like this. This person at the top, they know in this system, visualize this way, this, this person knows everything about the job to be done. And they take pieces of what they know and break it up and pass it down the line, right, to the, to the people below them, because they're above them. And then those people break down that thing, and those people break down that thing, until finally we've got fine enough instructions that we do not need skilled labor down here, and those people are just there to show up on time and carry out instructions. That's what this picture means. And the people at the bottom there, who are just carrying out instructions, in a knowledge work organization, that's your, that's your talent, right? These people went to college, they have certifications, they've studied a craft, and they're coming in and they report to a person who's there to give them instructions. If you are carrying out this model faithfully, you are hiring and paying for talent at that level and then just telling them what to do. <laughs> a modern successful company that looks at itself like this is a modern successful company in spite of this. Let's talk about meatloaf. So I guess I'll, I'll briefly recount the story uh, that, that Phil told this morning about the meatloaf. There's a mother and daughter and they're making meatloaf and it's a family tradition. And, you know, they, before they put it in the oven, they cut the ends off. And daughter like looks at mom and says, mom, why do we, why do we do that? Why do we cut the ends off the meatloaf? Isn't that, we're wasting perfectly good meat and loaf. And mom like is a little bit surprised. She starts thinking like, you know what, I don't know. I don't know why we do that. And uh, that's, the way my, that's the way my mother taught me. And so they call up the grandma and they go, hey, hey grandma, why, why do we cut the ends off the meatloaf? And there's a nervous laugh on the other end of the phone. She's like, yeah, I don't know. That's the way my mother taught me. Um, turns out, luckily, the great grandma is still alive and living in a nearby nursing home. They go visit great grandma. And she's kind of like, she's very old, you know, she's tired. She's kind of staring out the window, very still. And they say, great grandma, why don't we cut the ends off the meatloaf? And she just comes to life with laughter. Um, you know, maybe a little dust flies off. And, and like, <laughs> she goes, I don't know why you're cutting the ends off the meatloaf. I didn't have a big enough pan. I did it because I didn't have a big enough pan. So of course that's an allegory for we're still doing a thing that you know has long passed its usefulness because that's the way we've always done it because that's the way we've been taught about it. And that's, that's useful in this. But for me, actually, this is, a, this is a, actually a strong visual um, connection for how I'm thinking about the, the traditional upside down tree sort of org chart. Um, because this is, a, this is a company, right? And they interact with uh, customers, maybe vendors, people outside of the company. Um, but by design, many of them may not. Um, only these people are allowed to talk to the talk to the customer directly. Who's who's allowed to talk to the customer directly here? Not all of you. Um, okay. And on top of that, on top of that, this structure is designed to inhibit communication even across uh, departments with itself. Uh, you have to follow the chain of command by design in order to talk to somebody from another department. Um, and that's, that's very much on purpose. And so like I can envision industrialism imposed on a knowledge work organization. Industrialism is when we slice off the ends, the human ends of, of an organization that is solving problems for people at some point because that's the way we've always done it. It used to make sense. 
and now it's a little silly and wasteful. So let's talk about what the problem might be. This is Elon. Wait, sorry. This is Elon. Um, he's an interesting fellow. Uh, I don't agree with everything he says, certainly not on, on Twitter. Um, but uh, several years ago, he did have some really, I think, important and useful ideas about how he approaches problems, how he thinks. Uh, he says, the normal way that we conduct our lives is that we reason by analogy. We're doing this because it's like something else that was done or like something the other people, like other people are doing. It's slight permutations on a theme. First principles are a sort of physics way of looking at the world. You sort of boil things down to their most fun, excuse me, most fundamental truths and say, okay, what are we sure is true? or as sure as possible is true, and then reason forward from there, reason up from there. Um, so this idea of first principles thinking is the sort of thinking that's behind, for example, SpaceX, where he's got a commercial, he's gonna make a commercial space flight company. Um, and so, you know, maybe an incremental linear uh, reasoning by analogy way of doing, looking at that would be, I have to go get a rocket supplier. I have to get, you know, go buy some rockets. But he found that the cost for the materials to buy a rocket was astronomically different, pun intended, um, from the cost of actually buying a whole made rocket. And so he, he figured that he could um, save a lot of money and also maybe potentially undo a lot of assumptions and save a lot of problems if he just acquired the talent and the materials and built his own rockets. And we've seen that. We've seen that work every time one of his rockets lands itself backwards. We've never seen that before. He did that with, ostensibly with first principles uh, approach to the problem. So, you know, incrementalism um, versus first principles. All right, well, first principles. Agile has principles, we've got that. Let's just go to those and reason forward. And I've seen, I've seen lots of good talks where they go through the, the original 12 principles because it's hard to keep these in mind when you're just you know rolling death marches and scrum. Um, and that's, those are good talks, but this is not that talk because these are not first principles. These are principles, they're good principles, but they are not rolled all the way back to their most fundamental form. These are not the laws of physics. Um, if you ask, if you go through these and ask why about each of them, you'll find that there are some assumptions, some facts, some information in there to be uncovered that are, you know, a little more fundamental than these. So let's give that a try. Let's do this one. Business people and developers must work together through daily throughout the project. Why? Anybody? Why? Why should we do this? Yes, to exchange information. Why do we need to exchange information? A shared understanding. Why do we need a shared understanding? To bring out a viable product. To bring out a viable product. Okay, so that sort of implies that without the information being shared, that our product, we could make a product that's not viable. Okay, so from that, I can, I can reason that our work our, the work that we do is not consistently viable or consistently valuable. We could do work that doesn't yield value. Okay, let's try another one. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Why is that? Why do we want that? You get the benefit of collaboration between the people on the team. We want them talking to each other, right? Because they have, they have knowledge and maybe different viewpoints. Okay, okay, so we get the benefit of um, collaboration between the team. Why do we need those different viewpoints? Why do we need, we need those people talking to each other? Why can't they keep their eyes on their own paper and mind their own business like they learn in school? They have their own skills. They have their own skills, right. So we need a mixture of skills, but can't they just like do this one skill over here and then Apply the second skill over here. One idea fosters the next. One idea fosters the next, okay? What did I hear over here? They need to be understood. 
they need to be understood. Oh, they need to understand each other. Okay, their their work requires an exchange of information. Okay. Okay. Right, right. They want to. We want a high fidelity of of communication because there's a lot of information to be exchanged. Okay. Um, let's see the next one. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Why? What does technical excellence have to do with agility? You could create a poor product if you're not paying attention. Um, okay. Okay, so you want you want quality baked into that. How does that help agility? You, you actually uh, can build on things that have been developed before without worrying that they break. Okay, so there's a possibility that by building new parts of it, you could break old parts of it. Okay, so there's like a stability bit to that. Okay, so you could end up with bugs and uh, and problems because agility keeps applying changes to the software and it has to withstand those changes, right? Well, but why do we want to keep changing software? Why don't we just get it right the first time? Environment changes. Environment changes, the needs change. We may discover that some work that we did no longer has value or didn't have value to begin with. And this kind of takes me back to, I, I, think, I, I, I think the pattern that I think I see in here leads me to declare kind of an organizing principle. It's a central reference point that allows all other objects to be located like a conceptual framework. It's a core assumption from which all other things flow. And there's an idea in agility to me. It's more fundamental than process, value, change, truth, justice, the American way, all that good stuff about agile. And we're, we're always talking around it, but never talking about it. And I think we need to change that if we're gonna move forward together on this whole thing. It's this. The value of our work is unknowable until it's done and delivered to people. This is not an opinion. This is not a, uh, a process or a mechanic. It's not just that we don't, that's unknown. The value of our work is unknowable. We cannot possibly know it until we have done it and shipped it and gotten that feedback as to whether it connected with the problem we were trying to solve. Everything right up until that moment is a hypothesis. It's a bet. It's an experiment. And this is hinted at in the principles, but it's never properly, properly spelled out. Um, and there's some, okay, so there's some wiggle words in here like value and work. So let me, I, I made a couple of other drafts of this to try to make sure we triangulate our idea of what this means together. Um, you could also say the effectiveness of our effort is unknowable until it's done and delivered to people. The outcome of our output is unknowable. The result of our rigor, I really got into the alliteration on this, guys. Um, the result of our rigor is unknowable until it is done and delivered to people. So that's, that's kind of what I think is the fundamental thing that we're not talking about when we're talking, when we're talking to people about being, you know, being more agile. I cringe now at, at somebody who says, well, I know it's not agile. Excuse me. It's not agile to do this, but I'm going to do this. And it, the, the point is never to be agile. I know it's especially not to do Agile, but it's not even to be Agile. The point is to deliver value and to make that as predictable as it can be because it's not terribly predictable. That's what all of this stuff is about. Yes, sir? Yeah, so I'm going to pick on one of your words. Please do. And I'm coming from a perspective of user adoption. Uh -huh. And you can deliver all day to people, but if people don't use what you deliver to them or know how to use what you deliver to them, you're not going to get any value. So you're just saying it's delivered to people, so I'm picking on your delivery. Yeah, yeah. It's gotta be you use Okay, so you're you're saying you're saying that um, I just want to repeat for, for so that everybody hears. Um, the that 
even if you deliver it to people, it might not be valuable. Right. Um, yeah, so actually that's, that actually serves my point in that when you deliver it to people and they don't use it, you have learned that that work wasn't valuable. It's unknow, I just, I didn't say your, our work is not valuable until it's delivered to people. The value is unknowable until it's delivered to people. Yes? And I think this is even more general. I think it's any product. It any product. It doesn't matter if it's work or a product. Right. The value is unknowable until you, yes. until people are using it. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. Effort, work, rigor, thing that you can build, no matter, and it's not about quality either. This could have the, the shiniest quality and the best code behind it too. So this isn't a process, this isn't a, a meeting, this is not a solution. This, I think, is the problem. And it's, it's, a, it's a statement about a problem, the problem of knowledge work in general, not just software, knowledge work, any product, as the gentleman said, and our relationship to it what we can and can't know about it at any given point. When this is not true, when that problem statement is not true, when the work has linear predictable value, like I'm on a you know, factory line putting shoes together, I'm sewing the sole on a sneaker, every sole I sew on the sneaker adds value, predictably, linearly, I spend eight hours doing that, I've added eight hours worth of value. No, no question. Industrialism makes sense. Industrial ideas, the whole org chart thing, Taylor, all of that is a great solution to that kind of problem. Industrialism worked because it removed the unpredictable element of humanity from predictable work. Industrialism fails with the kind of work that you and I do because it removes the generative, creative element of humanity from work that is by its nature unpredictable. Work that calls for that whatever the void of where ideas come from, work that requires humanity, that's what your paycheck is for. Not for typing, not for showing up on time, certainly not for following instructions. Okay. So the Agile Manifesto was and is a reaction to industrialism. It, um, it's a solution to the problem that, that I was just discussing. It's, its strategy in solving that problem is to restore rich human contact to our work and to keep in knowledge work, keeping the knowledge with the work is essential and that's kind of what the, what the, you know, the essence of agility was meant to do in, in reaction to industrialism. And when this stuff sings, when we get agile right, when it works, um, it's because everyone involved, I think, un has a shared understanding of that problem that we're trying to solve, that work is not inherently valuable. And that agility, I think, is really just that's just what happens when we put work in, in its place relative to the humanity that's carrying it out. So let's talk about a couple of ways to do just that. How am I doing on time? All right, perfect. Okay, first, stop talking about Agile. <laughs> Putting the solution before the problem. We know this one as agilists. That you know, if you if you have ever been on a team that's you know you're trying to get user stories from a, a product owner, and they they show up with a word document that's got a picture of a screen and descriptions to the nines of all the fields on that on that screen. Just go build it. That's your that's just and they paste that into Jira, and that's a user story. Um, we know that it's a problem to show up with a solution before we have an understanding of the problem. So, Agilists, this goes for you too. Stop talking about the solution before we've talked about the problem. As they, as they work, your team will uncover that organizing principle. They will uncover this problem that we can't know the value of the work until it's done and shipped. 
This will come up naturally. The best thing you can do in leading them there is to point to it. Say, hey, that's a thing. We, we can't know. We can't know how valuable this is until we get some users on it, until we get their hands on it and we understand what's, what works about it, if they even want to pick it up at all, until we've collected some real user data. Just point that out. Don't talk to them about what they should do about it necessarily. Don't talk to them about process. But clarify this problem with them. Ask for their insight. Ask for their ideas. They'll give them to you. Trust, trust their brains that the company is writing checks for. And experiment with their ideas in a structured and rigored way. Second thing is align on purpose. I got clever here. It's align on the purpose of your work, but you're doing that on purpose. Align on purpose, meaning let's all get to, okay, so before I go into the solution, I need to tell you the problem. Have everybody on your team, just privately, on their own, no looking at each other's paper, write down what they think the mission and the vision and the goals for the project or product that they're working on. Have them write that down privately and submit it to you. And then, and then maybe have a conversation where we put all the, all the versions of that next to each other. Even, I, I've done this with every, every team that ever tells me, yeah, we're pointed in the same direction. Yeah, we have, a safe, we have an understanding of the, the purpose here, the goal of this. They come back to me with five or six different things that are completely different about the software. They're all sort of, you know, in the ballpark, right? But they're never usefully together on that idea. Spend some time with your, with your team and make sure everybody has this as an understood thing. Work with, work with the, the product owner and the stakeholders and the business to clarify the wording on vision, on mission, on key positive signals that you guys are moving in the right direction and refer to it often. Keep it public in your team and use it. And if you're on the receiving end of work and you don't understand its purpose, feel free as, as a professional to go into toddler mode. Ask why until you get to a reason that's not about software, until you get to something that's about people because that's the reason you're building that thing. Help people to see industrialism. This, yesterday this slide said help people to unlearn industrialism. But what I really, before we can unlearn industrialism, we have to see it. If, if we're going through agile-like motions, but we have industrial thinking in our heads and something goes wrong, which of those two things is going to get the blame? Agile or industrial? Agile. Because of those two things, it's the only one that's visible. People don't walk around thinking, I'm doing industrial stuff. It's baked in. It was taught to us when we were young. And it's what, it's what work looks like. You report to your boss. You're, you're the director of whatever is over you. We talk, we talk like this all day long. And there are other ways to visualize the relationships between people in an organization, especially doing knowledge work, other than upside down trees. At the very least, mentally rotate the tree this way so that the people in management and leadership positions are there to support the people doing the work. At the very least. But there's lots of other ways besides that. Um, but if we, don't, if we don't first help people to see industrialism, they won't be able to do a damn thing about it. It's like water to fish. Um, so it's important to understand where all these traditions, the, the cutting off of the meatloaf, we have to go ask grandma. We have to figure out where that stuff came from, what it looks like, and point it out. Again, point it out to your team. Show them this is an industrial artifact. Maybe there's a different way we can do this. Maybe there's a different way we can talk to each other, not by going through the chain of command. 
If somebody, if you're a manager, somebody comes to you uh, with a problem, don't go up and around the org chart to solve it. Push it back into their team by coaching them on how they can solve it themselves. Normalize uncertainty. The value of our work is uncertain until it's done and delivered to people. That's not incompetence, that's a fact. It's a fact about the work that we do and it's something that, that frankly, the people who um, arranged for you to be on a team that builds software are business people, right? They understand risk, they understand uncertainty. They just have cut the meatloaf until it's, uh, you, they have in their minds maybe isolated you from the uncertainty. But in order to do your job, you have to be exposed to that uncertainty as much as possible. We have to talk about the uncertainty, we have to point to it, we have to agree on a strategy for seeing it, measuring it, and dealing with it. We can't pretend it's not there. Managers, leaders, make space more than you make decisions. Support the infusion of humanity back into the work we're doing at the organizational team and individual levels. Don't, again, don't force communication through the chain of command. Coach people on the problems that they bring to you. Don't be one of those managers who says, don't bring, don't bring me a problem unless you have a solution. It's important for people to think through those things, but it's your job as a manager to help them do that. Because if you demand that they come with a problem that has a solution already stapled on, all you're gonna do is hide all the problems. They're not coming to you. Don't build machines out of people. Build tools and kits and resources and relationships. And then get out of the way and let humanity do that work. Makers, those of you who aren't managers, individual contributors, makers, step up, show up. Um, you may not have to show up on time, but you have to show up on purpose. Um, for this humanist approach to work, for the humanism to work, we have to meet our leaders halfway on this. We have to fill that space that they make. Um, bring your whole self to work. Stop asking for complete instructions. Ask for clarity on the problems. And you're going to be, you know, this is, this is scary. You're accountable for the solutions that you come up with. But it's your manager's job to make that safe. We need all the brains in order to do this work, especially yours. This is Tony. Hey, Tony. Uh, this is Tony Hoagland, an American poet. We lost him a couple of years ago, but um, he had a, a line in uh, the poem Wasp. Um, that's a human being should have a warning label on the side that says disorganized narrative inside. I have to imagine that part of industrialism was trying to fix this. And it did for predictable work that was right. We put work before humanity. And our work right now, the valuable work, the right work, it's not predictable. It's not something that we can cut humanity out of the equation on. And making people into better machines doesn't help us do it. Work is not inherently valuable, but the people who do it are. We need to intentionally put the horse before the cart with those two things. So what's going to lead us to success with this problem in this century, it's not going to be your compliance, your machinery, your grade point average, your processes, your certifications, or how many views your post got on LinkedIn. We can't just incrementally build on what worked in the last century, that was solving a different problem. We have to build a new platform on which our grandchildren are gonna work and play and solve their problems. Where we're going, we're gonna need your awkwardness, 
your anxiety, your inconsistency, your anticipated unpredictability, your nerves, your stuckness, your confusion, and your confident incorrectness. Thank you for your humanity, and thank you for your time and attention. We had some good discussion during, um, but I do want to I do want to leave it open. If anybody has any other comments, questions, I do think there is something to say with the uncertainty with the deliverable for what you were saying. Hmm. There, there's a process where you could potentially do like an ROI beforehand, like kind of scaling out like the return on the investment for say it's going to be a purchase for like third party vendor. Okay. Or just if it's something that's say there's like a bug or something that you guys are going to fix it's like what are the main or sorry it's a manual process that basically there's a change going forward it's like you can basically calculate how many man hours are spent um, on fixing those problems or completing that manual process to where you can kind of get a calculation of how much time or what do you be putting into development and how much money that would save from the business type of things yeah you can predict it right so you can you know, there is ways you can basically give some certainty to the uncertainty yeah, so by using a return on investment calculation, a very specific one, that's a wise move in, in a field where you can't know the value of your work, but you still don't know the value of your work. You're predicting, you're forecasting it. Sure. In the same way that you know we have very skilled meteorologists every day that predict the weather, a lot of the time they're right because you know the advances in science and everything, but it's not 100%. Especially thinking about like if you think about the, how they predict the path of a hurricane sure. What they give you what you see and what's normal on the news to see is a cone of uncertainty sure. They've normalized uncertainty in that in that industry yeah. in a way that maybe we haven't okay. I think but yes, you're right. There are loads of good methods to try to close that gap You're never going to do it 100% yeah. All right. Thanks everybody